and things like that, but it's, we're going through the big chunks to give you really a kind of overview of the whole Bible, and you can kind of read with me while I explain some things in the Bible. Well, the first slide, I want to um, make an announcement, kind of, that we're going to have a morning prayer from, like, from tomorrow till June, um, first week of June, before the Pentecost. And I, I explained this to you when we were going through Leviticus and Numbers, where he says, you shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. That's actually the resurrection day. So from the resurrection day, we are to count seven Sabbaths. So when the Bible says you count something, what do you think it means? Right? It means that you're expecting something, right? Like you count your birthday. You count, like, graduation. Now, some of you guys are graduating. You count the days, like, oh, man, I'm almost done with school, right? And you kind of worry about, okay, what I'm going to do afterwards. But, but that's the thing. Like, you, you, you think about that. You anticipate what's going to happen on the Pentecost. So that's the day. You know, the uh, Passover for this year was on the 10th, right? And the 16th, the April, that was the resurrection day. And you count seven Sundays from that, and it's the June 4th, which is the Pentecost. So in light of that, we want to have morning prayer. We can come and pray and to read the Bible for you to get your hearts right before the Lord, before you, um, you know, start the day, right? Until, you know, kind of the anticipation of the Spirit coming. Yes, but the Spirit is already here and giving us the ministry of Christ and giving us a way where we can be like Christ. Right? And that's His Spirit. Jesus' Spirit indwells in us for us to continue the work of Christ and for us to be like Christ, to bear the fruit of the Spirit. Right? And so in light of that, we're having morning prayer. And uh, some days I won't be here, but I'm sure somebody else will come and open the doors and things like that. So uh, if not, you can just uh, pray outside and then just, you know, that, that'd be fine too. You know? yeah. So... Today I'm going to share with you three important matters from chapter 1 through chapter 11. One has to do with commandments and covenant. And sometimes we live in the new, co- new, new um, covenant. And what does the commandment has to do with it? And I talked to many people you know, from 1990 when I began to go to church until now. And I think we all have a little bit different view. I think a little bit different is okay, but we have to really understand what is the covenant and what is the commandment. How do they go together? And the other one is to look at partial explanation of Moses explaining what it means to love God uh, and the meaning of life in the wilderness. And this is all in the text right there. So some of them I'll read, some of them we can read together. Okay, first the title. The title Deuteronomy, you know, sometimes you guys, how do you spell Deuteronomy, right? So you just say it a little bit slower, Deuteronomy, kind of like that. So Nami means the law, and Deuter is, the, you know, kind of the second law. And that uh, name, we get it from the Latin Vulgate, right, Latin version of the Bible, or the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament. Right? And so that's why we get the name Deuteronomy. But the Hebrew title is, These Are the Words, right? which is the very first two words from the book of Deuteronomy. Um, you know, when he says Deuteronomy, the second law, it doesn't mean that it's a something new, but it's a explaining, explaining the law, the new generation of Israelites are going into the promised land. So they are, they are graduating from the wilderness, Right? So no more wilderness in 40 years. Right? And the, all the old generation have died off. And now the Joshua is leading the new generation into the promised land. And Moses basically giving them three sermons. Right? He's explaining what the law is. Right? And so basically that's the way this Deuteronomy kind of unfolds. Right? And so verse 5 um, when you look at it, it says, East of the Jordan, in the territory of the Moab, Mo- Moses began to expound this law, saying, right? It's the very beginning, right? Chapter 1, verse 5. So Moses is expounding 
the law of God. So he's explaining to us, he's interpreting for us, and he's giving us applications in how we can you know, follow the law of God. Right? And so I'm going to a little bit explain a little bit more that too. And also in verse chapter 4, 13, right, he declares to you this covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me, Moses, at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Right? So it's a, it's a Ten Commandments, and it's explaining it, and it's more laws of applying how these people can follow the Lord. I think it's kind of important because I think for us, we wanna, when we want to do something, we need to understand correctly. We need to it's some explanation of what that means and how we need to apply those kind of things as well. Right? And so Moses is doing that for us. Yeah. So, and when, as Moses is doing that, explaining to the law, and do you, do you know that how many laws are there? Most scholars say there's a 613 laws. And if you boil that down, you get 10, right? And you get, boil that down, what do you get? You get the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself, Right? And so sometimes we think as a law has a very negative connotation. Oh, law. Right? It, it, it really bound us. And like, you know, I got a nice car. I want to go as fast as I can, right, on the freeway. But the, it says 65. Oh, it really. But then, right, even though we may think it's a very negative, but it's a very positive thing. This is what somebody says. It says, what man and woman lost in the garden, garden of Eden, is now restored to them in the Torah, namely God's plan for their lives. See, they lost it. They sinned and they got kicked out of the garden of Eden, but in the ways that God is reestablishing that relationship with the Israelites, God is giving them Torah, the law, the instruction to establish them to understand God's plan for their lives, right? So, so there's 613 laws, 10 commandments, the, the, the great commandment, right? The, 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 the great commandment is given in Matthew 22, 36 to 37, right? Let's read it together. Ready? Go. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus said this, and what do you think Jesus got this? I mean, he had his own authority to, to say what he wants because of, you know, he is the Son of God. But did you know that he's kind of quoting the Old Testament? When you look at the next slide, right, it says he got that from Deuteronomy 6, 5, right? It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And Leviticus says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. You, you, you see it? You know, and when Jesus was tempted, by the devil, right? And every time he got tempted in the ways that he overcame was using the word of God as well, right? And so, so this begs the question, right? The, 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 what is the old covenant and the new covenant and what does the commandment has to do with it, right? And I think some of us think, oh, now we are people of the new covenant, right? The commandments are gone. I don't have to do anything. Right? I just have to be you know, in loving relationship with God, whatever that means. Right? And He loves me. He forgives me. He gives me grace. And I just do whatever I want. That licentiousness. Right? The freedom in Christ and to do everything. And Paul says very clearly, right? everything is permissible, not all beneficial. And so I want to explain to that a little bit, and I think John Piper did a great job. So I'm going to read that to you, right? And you can kind of follow along on the screen, 
right? So, so in this, you know, I'm not reading it yet. The commandments are still commandments, but the covenant has been changed from the tabernacle or temple to finish work of Jesus Christ. That's the difference. We don't come to God through the tabernacle or temple or in their sacrificial system, but through Jesus Christ. That has been changed. So this is what John says, right? Jesus shatters any absolute disassociation of commandments and love. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Dot, dot, dot. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he is, he is, he, it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Did, did you see that? Right? Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Thinking in terms of commandments and obedience did not stop Jesus from enjoying the love of His Father. And He expects that our thinking of Him as one who commands will not jeopardize our love relationship with Him either. This is crucial to realize because the covenant relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ is not a covenant without commandments. The basic, hallelujah, amen, right? Amen. Right, yeah. The basic difference between the old covenant offered by God through the Mosaic law and the new covenant offered by God through Christ is not that one had commandment and the one did not. Right? And I think sometimes we think like that. The key difference that are, are that number one, the Messiah, Jesus has come and shed the blood of the new covenant so that henceforth he is the mediator of the new covenant and all saving covenant keeping faith is conscience faith in him. Number two, the old covenant has therefore become obsolete. Right? Hebrew talks about that. And does not govern the new covenant people of God. And the promise of uh, the promised new heart and the enabling power of the Holy Spirit has been given through faith. Right? In the old covenant, the gracious enabling power to obey God was not poured out as fully as it is since Jesus. To this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. What new, uh, what's new about the new covenant is not that there is no com com commandments, but that God, God's promise has come true, right? I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their heart. Jeremiah 31, those of you who took Living Life, you better remember that. This is, I said, like three times already, right? I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Ezekiel. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to work in that, to walk in that. See, that's the work of God. That is the difference. It's not that new covenant people have no commandment, but yes, we have commandment, but in the ways that we're going to obey it is that God's going to put His Spirit in us. He's going to write His law, not on the stone, but on our hearts and in our minds. So when something is written in our hearts, what happens? You will do it. You will do it what is written in your hearts. And that's what God has promised in the new covenant. It's not no commandment, but it is the new relationship with God that God has poured His Spirit within us, given us His Spirit. The third person in Trinity has come inside of us, which is the hope of glory, and for us to live the life that God wants us to live in His power, in His power, indwelling in us and controlling all things, giving us perspective, give us motivation, give us power, give us understanding of His will even to do those things. You know, one thing we must understand is that 
God is love. And He does everything out of His love. Everything out of His love. There's nothing He does that is not out of the love. Right? God's love motivates, right? And, and, and His law, and His, right? He, 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 he motivates, but, but let me say God's love was the motivation for He giving us His law. He loves us. That's why He tells us what to do. He gives us purpose. He gives us how to live this life. And again, this is a, not the negative connotation, but a positive connotation. Right? I know many of us ran like last Sunday. And I know some, person, some people came up to me and said, Oh, now what? What do you mean now what? Now you go read the Bible <laughs> and pray and evangelize, you know? Right? It's no now what? What are you going to do? Run 50 miles? Run 100 miles? Run 2,000 miles? So what? So what you can run 2,000 miles? It doesn't matter that much. It doesn't, right? So we have to understand this positive connotation of God giving us His instructions, His law. Right? And his love motivates his governance. He, he's, he's, he, he loves us. That's why he wants to govern us. He wants to tell us what we ought to do. And he wants to sit next to us, walk right next to us, and really give us the directions and wisdom. Right? And man's love for God must be motivated. Right? And for us to obey God as well. And through the repentance of our lordship, of our lives, a lot of times we want to take the lordship back and we want to be our own lord. And we have to repent from that and receive Christ right, as our lord and savior. As the spirit of God resides inside of us to rule and cause everything you know, for us to live in his way. Yeah. And that's the important. New covenant people is the Spirit lives in us. And He is the Lord of all. And every moment, that Spirit is available for us, for us to see from His perspective, for Him to give us His will, for, uh, for Him to give us His power for us to do it. You know, when you look at Galatians chapter 5, it has all this nasty list and a good list. The last nasty list is what? This work of flesh. Even you want to do good things, you know, and, and we want to do good things with our own power. Then what happened? The envy and strife. Even you're trying to encourage others to walk in Christ, right? Walk in His ways, right? Then if I did that in the Spirit of God, what should reside in me? What should be the residual of that? Love, joy, and peace, and patience, and goodness, and kindness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control, because that is the fruit of the Spirit, right? But when we do it with our own power, you know, when I try to muster up things and I'm, man, those people are not changing, man. What's, what's their problem, you know? What's the problem? It's me. It's not you, it's me. Because I'm doing the fleshy way. And I can tell because the Bible says the work of flesh is obvious. It's obvious, right? You try to encourage your brother, encourage your son or daughter or husband or wife, to do or to be or or to think and right and after that what is the leftover? Do you feel love and joy, you know, or peace or or you're something else, right? Right? And he tells us, oh my goodness. And I get to see that in myself too. They mean well, but when we work out of the flesh, not from the spirit, right? Those leftover stuff is kind of the nasty stuff. Right? It's very important. New covenant in the relationship with God. God, Jesus says, it is finished. And that spirit lives in us. Right? And the second thing I want to explain to you is that, you know, how Moses is explaining, right? Explaining the great commandment or 10 commandments or 613 laws. Right? So I want to explain the one thing, what it means to love God with all of your heart. And that's in chapter 6. Chapter 6 and... Right, and, and I'm going to read a couple lines here and explain to you a little bit and explaining, the Moses explaining, right? You know, uh, because it's been so long ago. Right? Said, These are the commands, decrees, and law the Lord your God directed me to teach you 
to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. That you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. And you see this commands and decrees and laws? And basically what he's asking us is that who do you who, who do you who, who's your rule giver? Who, who do you live by? You know, how, how do you live? You know, what controls you? What rules you? You know what I'm saying? So is it God's commands, God's decrees, and God's instructions, God's laws? Or is it you? And that's the question. Right? And so he's going to tell him, you know, God is telling Moses to tell the people, yeah, who, who do you rule by? Who, who's your rule? You know? I mean, you know, when you go to grade school, what happened? You got a little ruler, right? To figure out how much the thing is. And you don't figure out your own ruler. I say, oh, I'm going to make my own ruler. And, like, you know, maybe straight edge, right? But then not the distance, because distance is something that is very absolute. And he's, that's what he's questioning us. What rules you? Who's your boss? As a citizen of God's kingdom, you know, the idea of God's kingdom rules you, or do you rule yourself? That's what he's asking us. And he says, fear the Lord. Right? Fear actually means the utmost concern, having utmost concern for God, about the Lord, priority on Him, by keeping all His decrees and His commands and His understanding, utmost respect for Him, for He is the Creator, and for He is the one who has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. He is the one for Israelites. He is the one who brought Israelites out of the Egypt, from their slavery, right? For them to live in freedom as a new people of God, right? So it's more of having that utmost concern. And the verse, verse 4, uh, verse 3, it says, Hear, O Israel. You know, in, in, in Hebrew, that's Shama. Everybody says Shama. Shama. At least now, you know, at one word in, in Hebrew, Shama. Shama, O Israel, right? It's like saying, listen. Right? And so again, it kind of com- connects to us and like, what am I listening to? Am I listening to the word of God? Right? Am I listening to my friends? I, I'm not saying don't listen to your friends, but you have to check if what your friends are saying aligns with the, what God is saying. And your parents, your, you know, I tell our kids, don't listen to me, I'm shady, if I'm shady. You know, yeah. I mean, they should listen to me if I'm not shady, right? If I'm speaking the word of God, and that's the thing. You know, you can listen to people and see how they align with the word of God. And I think it's very interesting right here. I'm going to move on a little bit faster. But um, next slide, please. And it says, it says, verse 7, Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Right? Yeah, talk about them. It's kind of interesting because the application is clearly saying that loving God also means that we tell our kids, our children about God. Right? And that kind of tells me that first, I must live it first before I tell them to my kids. You know, because I think some of parents, right, I'm not saying I'm not one of those, but, you know, like, we say, don't do what I do. Do as I say. <laughs> right? And basically, it's a kind of hypocritical lifestyle, right? That's not cool. Right? And, 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 you know, yeah, little kids, sometimes they may not tell you that, that that's not very cool, but then they may think that's not very cool. They may not verbally question you, but they are questioning you in their you know, they're very smart. You know that, right? Yeah. Uh, they are. And number two is that we must have time to talk to our children. I heard from a study that average father talks to their children 37 seconds a day. Yeah. Man, that's long. You know, wow. That's, that's, man, that's, that's a long time. 37. Try time 37 seconds if you can talk to your kids that long, you know? Yeah. I'm, I was just kidding, but you know, right? Yeah, it's 37 seconds. Wow, you know, yeah, yeah. We're talking about children, right? Who are still living at home, and they're of course they're busy. 
and, and we're busy too, right? But priority must be that the children over other things where we can, we must live the way Christ told, tells us to live and really teach them and talk to them. And look at them. Look at that. How, how we're supposed to do it. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down at home. When you walk along the road. I guess when you drive together. I guess that's the, that's the equivalent of the 21st century, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you lie down, right? But now they live in different bedrooms. I'm sure that back then it was only one bedroom. We kind of you know, lived together, but then they live in the... So sometimes they can sleep with you. That's okay. Right? And so you can talk to them when you lie down or lie down on your couch or something or when you get up. Basically all the time. All the time that you are to impress what God has said upon their, their heart. Yeah. And, and what do you need to talk about? What do you need to teach them? Talk about school, talk about success, talk about Justin Bieber, or whatever, you know, talk about worldly stuff. No. He's talking about things of the Lord. His commandment, His ways, His plan, His will, His character, and His goodness, and His <coughs> gentleness, His kindness. Right? It's very important for us to experience, right, the characteristics of God, character of God, Right? And really impressing them on our, on our kids. Yeah. And, and I don't know where I got this line, but some, some book I read a long time ago. If you know more about Stephen Curry than Apostle Paul, you have a problem. Yeah. If you know all about MLB, NFL, NBA, you know, or NHL, whatever those kind of things, all the three letters, the entertaining things that if you know more about those kind of things <laughs> in the Bible, you have a problem. Yeah, we do. We have a problem. We're so entertainment-centered world, right? But we don't know. We're biblically very illiterate. That's why verse 8 and 9 talks about right, putting a symbol. Like I, I, I wear this, if I don't forget. Remember, I, I sold you the, the leather thing, right? right? From, I got it from India. It's not just buying stuff like that and just like decorating it. No, it's wearing things. Right? And put it on your phone. I'm not, you know, let's not be too awkward or something. But what is that for? It's, it's like helping one another, right? Helping one another to, oh man, you know, that represents, you know, Acts 1 3, Acts 1 8, and, and we should be about God's word. We should be about God's businesses. Yeah. It's not reminding just for myself, but it's reminding of one another, right? I heard this person in Arizona, in, I think it was in college. He was reading his Bible before class began, and the teacher told him not to read that. And the teacher said, I don't want other students to see him read the Bible, right? And that is why I'm not allowing him to read the Bible. And listen, the course is this crazy world that we're living in. But that's the thing, right? We have to remind ourselves, remember, right? Our existence depends on God. Remember that He is our Heavenly Father. He is the one who created us. He knows and He loves, right? And He's the one who have delivered the Israelites out of Egypt and is leading them to this promised land. That is God who so loved us and sent, his, sent us His begotten Son to die for us, for our sins, so that when we believe in Him, we will give Him the eternal life to live with Him forever and ever, right? And look at verse 10 and 11. It's kind of shocking. It says, God so wants to bless us when bless us when the Lord your God brings you into the land He swore to your fathers to Abraham Isaac and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide well you did not dig the vineyard and olive groves you did not plant you know when I when I was reading this I was thinking about our church. You know, when we merge with the first uh, Foothill Baptist Church, you know, we are given this beautiful place. We can come together and to worship together without any restraints. And you guys, I know you can, many of you guys come and study at nighttime. Oh, sure, come. Come and study. Use the church building in all you can. Right? I think it's, it's, it's great, but, you know, it's, this was given to us to share. And even coming to America, man, come to America, it's everything is coming to Cal Poly. Every place you go, like, wow, I didn't really build that. The people be, before us built all that. And we're so blessed. Aren't you not blessed? 
to live in this the, the, this universe and this this world and and this country and this this right this this, this state. We're so blessed, right? You know, but then there is a problem. Can God bless you? Look at twelve. He said, "Be careful that you do not forget the Lord." And sometimes when we are so blessed, what happens to us? We forget about the person who has blessed us. You know, you know those people, right? You know me. Yeah. When you have, don't have boyfriend, girlfriend, man, you come to church so faithfully, you, you, you go to prayer meetings, you know, and, and, and you serve, and well, you're just at church all the time, and I guess you had nothing to do, because once you got a boyfriend or girlfriend, like, oh, what happened? Did rapture happen? You know, like, you know, did I miss it? You know, they, they, they're just gone. You know, what happened? Did he move, or did she move? Right? You're focusing on so much on the blessing, not the person that who has given the blessing. Can God bless you without worrying that that blessing will turn you away from God to the blessing itself? Can do that? And that's very related to the next slide that I show. I want to show you is that first chapter eight. It talks about. The, the life in the wilderness. The purpose of the wilderness was training them to go into the promised land. That they were slaves and they needed to be trained as God's people. Right? It says, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter the possess right, the land that God, a Lord promised and owed to your forefathers. Remember, how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. Right? You know, so the life in wilderness, wilderness was a training. Training so that when you go through testing, you know, okay, is this, did I pass or did I fail? If I pass, praise the Lord. If I fail, praise the Lord for you know that you fail. You know what you have to do now. Right? So testing is a good thing for you to know. Right? And, and other than Caleb, who really hung on to the word of God, right? All these other 600,000 people, right? They were not clinging on to the word of God. They were clinging on to their, what they saw in their own eyes and their emotions and their feelings. Right? And they all said, no, 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 no God's words. What I see is that we're going to get slaughtered by these people in the land of Canaan. I don't want to go in there. But the Caleb says, no, God has given to us. We've got to just go there and conquer it. And the Bible tells them very clearly that, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. Right? He has a different spirit. So this time in the wilderness is for our heart, for their hearts to be developed, to be like Caleb, to be like Joshua, the who's, right, who's, who's, who follows God wholeheartedly. All these guys complain. Something goes, no water. Oh, we got no water. No food. Oh, no food. Right? Even the water is, if you look at the map there, in the, the kind of trail, man, they complain right here. But like next day, they found water. You know? It's like they need to just stay a little bit, kind of be faithful. Like, I know God's going to provide for me, you know. It's, all, it's cool. Right? But then, no, they were complaining and, you know, and Moses got in trouble as well. Right? So that's the thing. Are you complaining? Right? Complaining hard like the 600,000 Israelites or are you like the Caleb and Joshua who said, cling on to the word of God. In the wilderness, they were being trained to have a heart like Caleb. Obedient heart for God's words. You know, things happen in our lives. And that thing humbles us. It humbles us to test us if you are living by His word. Do I complain like the Israelites? You know, where's my promotion? Where's my wife? Where's my husband? Where's my job? Where's my comfort? Or do I trust the word of God for God sent His Son and died on the cross and rose again Pro- proving to us that Jesus is the Lord of the dead and Lord of the living. That we can trust Him 
with our lives, for He already kept all His promises, and that He has given us this this purpose of making disciples of all nations. And all the things you complain about, fifty million years later, you think those things gonna matter? Fifty million years later, those things not gonna matter. Everybody look at me. 50 million years later, only thing is going to matter is who's in heaven and who's not in heaven. Right? It's not going to matter, oh, do we have a nice comfy seat at church? Or do we even have seats? Oh, who, oh did you know my fine looking wife, you know? 50 years, I might be 50 years later, it won't matter. I mean, they will all look same, you know? <laughs> They would, right? Look at all our Korean ajumas, you know? Like, they all look the same, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. They won't matter. Amen. No one will care about who won the NBA championship, World Cup, Super Bowl, who finished the marathon or not, in what time, your GPA even, praise the Lord! Yeah. And your occupation... 50 million years later, only thing that's going to matter is who's in heaven and who's not. God humbles us and tests us that are we living by the relationship with God. That's what the Bible says, right? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of mouth of God. That means, do you live by the relationship with God? Does that fuel you? Doing His work, does that fuel you to give you the food that you need to live? Have you guys experienced that, doing God's work? You don't need to eat. You forget to eat. Man, you, there's a food that God gives you when you do the work of God, right? right? And sometimes I know you, you, we'll, we'll be done at the, you know, like sometimes, and like, oh, I'm hungry, let's go to IHOP. Man, let's go to IHOP, just go sleep, man. <laughs> you know, go to IHOP, you know, yeah. So what do you do? Do you just eat and don't eat God's word? And whenever time you eat, that's why God provides manna for us. And manna is a, is a reminder of that we don't live by bread alone. We live by Right? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Whenever you eat nice taco, Tony's taco, you don't just think about how good this is. Man, you don't eat taco alone, right? You live by the word of God, right? And you eat, and you think about, oh man, I gotta eat God's word. When you look at these things, oh man, I gotta eat God's word. I gotta read it, I gotta meditate it, I gotta memorize it, I gotta understand it, I gotta apply it, I gotta teach unto other people, etc., etc. And that is a life that we're being trained in this life. Yeah. And we need to be trained. So come to prayer meeting tomorrow morning. Do your quiet time daily. And that's my application. Is that you got to, you know, I, I have not been serious about this or even pro, you know, promoting that. You got to do your quiet time seriously. Word and commandments and to understand and asking God's spirit. Yeah, you empower me. You, you tell me what you, you want me to do. And you give me the power for, for me to do these things. You know, Philippians 2.30, we've got to experience that. Right? And practice love and obedience to God through different applications. You've got to be very specific in the applications of how God is giving you that kind of application for you to obey. When humble, trust in God. Look at eternity. 50 million years later, would that matter? Not really. You know? Yeah, you know, like we were running, man, Caleb was running like two miles ahead of me. I'm like, man, he kind of, I was going up, he was going down. I'm like, okay, Caleb, thank you. <laughs> and you know what? I was going down, I saw some other guys that I used to play soccer with, and he's like, you know, in high college too. Like, hey, you, what's up, man? I was like, Mark for Jesus! You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Mark, we're trusting God, and we're going to look for eternity, and we're going to make disciples because that is the way God has told us to live. Amen? So let's get serious in our relationship with God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know that is going to fuel you. That's going to fill you. And that's going to prompt you to live this you know, abundant life that God has promised us. Let's all stand up. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for what you have told us today, this relationship between commandment and covenant. Father, help us to
fix our minds of the current generation's error in that we don't have to do anything. So Father, convict our hearts right now. The thought that that commandments are, are done away with. We're living in the new covenant. But may your truth set us free for us to relate to you in, in truth. Father God, we thank you so much for in the ways that you have given us how we are to apply, how we are to love you with all of our hearts. Father, those of us, if we have not been thinking specifically how we are to apply that command, Father, help us. Help us right now and speak to us. Give us one or two ways how we can apply and to express our love for you. Father, give us specific plans to read your word daily. Read your words day and night to meditate upon it. Not to go to right or left, but to obey it for us to experience that abundant life. Father, I know you are humbling some of us in this season of life through different things, economically, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And help us not to lose sight of you, Lord. Help us to know that what we lack and in the ways that you're humbling us for us to draw closer to you, Lord. For us to hear you, for us to know that you are still in control of all things and that you you love us. Your love has never ceased. So I want you to kind of think through some of the applications and what God has spoken to you today, and just meditate upon that like a minute in your heart right now. And be very specific in your relationship with God. And your relationship with God must be very real. 